the 1970s, Switch took charge of the charts with the musical style and versatility that was true to their name. Often one person would be on the drum and the next thing you know, they would be playing the keyboard and singing lead vocals, switching up, which is why their name fit so perfectly. And those songs were delivered by two of Pop's music most captivating lead singers, Philip Ingram and Bobby DeBarge. They had that signature sound with both Bobby and Philip. that would become known as Switch got its start in Grand Rapids, Michigan, where founder Greg Williams was born in 1954. I wanted to be a producer, sure. more or less. But what's going to get me there the fastest? And I said, put together a, a, a good band where everybody plays more than one instrument. Right. Everybody sings. Got a good-looking band. Got to have a good-looking band. Yeah. And something that's going to work. And more importantly than all of that, were guys with like minds, mm -hmm. meaning guys that felt like me, do or die. Right. Nothing else is going to stop this from doing it. And fortunately, I was blessed to pull together the six guys that the world got to know at Switch. Robert DeBarge was the shy but talented eldest son of a musical clan called the DeBarge Children. Music was always a constant in the DeBarge household. None of them knew how to read music, but they all played by ear. But the genius of it all came from Bobby. But for Bobby and his nine siblings, music was more than a hobby. It was all that made their young lives bearable. Their father was very abusive with the first of the five of them. A troubled Caucasian truck driver married their mom, an African-American homemaker named Ederlene. He would often take his frustrations out on his wife and his 10 children. Bobby often caught the brunt of his father's rage. They often lived in fear, but the fact that they still had their music, sing in church, and believed in God, they were able to get through some of the things they had to deal with. But for Bobby, there were some things singing couldn't help him escape from. He beats the Bobby and Tommy and Bunny the worst. I stay out of his way, <laughs> but but he I remember he knocked me out one time. Greg and Bobby spent their first years after high school brushing up on their skills and playing gigs around Grand Rapids until an opportunity in 1973 bought them a ticket out. A friend of Bobby's called him up and said, we have a deal on a table with Barry White. Do you want to come and join? So Greg and Bobby ended up moving to Phoenix, Arizona to secure a gig for the Soul Legend side project, White Heat. White Heat would release a self-titled album in 1975 that didn't make a lot of noise. So Bobby returned back to Grand Rapids where his demons took a darker turn. He would end up on heroin. Meanwhile, Greg and Jody headed back to Akron in the Ohio funk circuit along with Bobby DeBarge's bass playing younger brother Tommy. The goal was to have a group where each of the members played different instruments. To fill out the group, Greg recruited instrumentalists MC Clark and Eddie Flewellen and singers Philip Ingram and Arnie Hayes. They flew out to Detroit and went to the Motown building and were trying to get a record deal. They had one cassette tape and they got in the elevator and who would walk in but Jermaine Jackson and his wife at the time, Hazel Gordy, Barry Gordy's daughter. They would give Jermaine Jackson the tape and Jermaine would call them the next day saying he liked their music. Jermaine, however, wanted to have a showcase. Bobby sang and played keyboards, Philip sang and would get on the percussions. Tommy would get off the bass. They were switching instruments back and forth. They blew them away. When they got signed, Barry Gordy absolutely loved them. How'd you get a name like Switch? Uh, well, go ahead. <laughs> like Switch is, uh, it derived out of us doing different things instrumentally and musically and vocally because like we all got different tastes and different styles that, that we like to do so. Right. Yeah. And performed in different groups before you got together. Oh, definitely. You fellas write and produce your own material, do you? Yes. 
Who's the sort of the leader? Or is it like a democratic group? <laughs> it's a democratic group. <laughs> Everybody points to him and he says it's a democratic group. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. And we'd also like to congrat congratulate Jermaine and Hazel for having such good taste in discovering this group. How about it for Switch? When Switch signed to Motown in 1977, it felt like a lifeline for the band and a fresh burst of energy for Barry Gordy's Motown. They were a band as opposed to just the singing group. For Motown, it was the closest thing they had since the Jackson 5. I don't know what's gonna happen to you, baby. That combo of Bobby and Phillip was just as good as it gets. And Switch put those talents on display with their debut single titled, They'll Never Be. Don't try to hide your nature. They'll Never Be shot to number six on the singles R&B chart. And Switch would pull in more fans with their next single. Many days have I want to be closer would let the record label know that this is the real deal. The six members of the band went from an unknown band to a household name. And Motown was determined to keep the momentum going. Less than a year after Switch hit stores, a follow-up Switch 2 was complete. But when it came time to release the album's lead single, fans were in for a surprise. They had a fast up-tempo song. After all, this was the disco era. Best Beat in Town became Switch's second top 10 hit. With harmonies and our beats, you won't stop. It wasn't really respected by hardcore funk fans. So for their next single, Switch returned to their sweet spot with a ballad sung by Bobby DeBarge. The intro gave guys and girls time to find a dance partner. And then it went to that other level. It's just one of those classic songs that transcends time. I'm not weary about a dog on feet. I take anything you bring. That would be Switch's signature song. Indeed, I Call Your Name shot to number 10 on the R&B song chart. This will push the Switch 2 album into the top 10. I'm a man now, baby, a grown man. And I came alone with But when it came time to release the Reaching for Tomorrow album, Bobby overplayed his hand. They used to have their band meetings up at Barry Gordy's home. Well, you have a little bit of success, and so... Then after a while... Barry Gordy's home, we're working on a third album, and it was um, there's a song called Power to Dance that's on a, it's on a third album. And um, now imagine, Cindy, we're sitting at Barry Gordy's home. He's helped groom, I mean, come on, the Jackson 5, the Miracles, the Temptations, you know. Absolutely. So it's um, like, mm -hmm. so we're sitting in there. And so, and again, you have to admit, he helped create who Bobby had become because mm -hmm. he had been giving him this leeway. So he says, Power to Dance is a number one record. I love the energy. I love the melody, but the lyrics need to be changed. Yeah. Bobby well, why wouldn't Bobby change the lyrics? And that's what Bobby said. He said, I think the lyrics are fine. I remember I was 20 years old and I said, are you kidding me? When we did our first album, mm. it, it was a group. By the time we got to that third album, he mm. felt like it was him. Oh, okay. From that point on, they was never back at Barry Gordy's home ever again. And that would be the beginning of the end. Things weren't going great for the DeBarge brothers either. While Bobby and Tommy continued mentoring their younger siblings in DeBarge, contractual stipulations kept them from joining the group. And as he began preparing solo tracks for what would be his solo debut on Motown, old habits would begin to derail Bobby's post switch ambitions bobby wanted to be a solo artist motown gave him the chance but they didn't realize how much bobby was on drugs at the time and during the album that kind of came out and everybody was dropped from motown after that
strapped for cash and with a new family to support, Bobby turned to desperate measures to make ends meet. One day in 1988, the law caught up with him. One day, his wife heard a knock at the back door and Bobby tried to run out the back door and there were the cops bringing him back in with their shotguns. Bobby was arrested on drug trafficking charges, sentenced to five years in prison. Two years later, Tommy was also arrested on drug charges. By the time Bobby DeBarge got out in 1993, he had been diagnosed as HIV positive, a condition that progressed to full-blown AIDS. He was writing songs in prison so that when he got out, he could do a record. Once he got out, he wanted Greg to help him on an album. All of his energy went into getting that album done, but he was also drained emotionally and physically from the AIDS. Bobby completed work on his solo debut, which he named It's Not Over. But by August of 1995, he had entered the final stages of the disease and returned to his hometown of Grand Rapids. He was put in hospice care. Two weeks after the release of It's Not Over, June 16, 1995, Bobby DeBarge would succumb to AIDS complications. He was 39 years old. Through the 1990s, the core group members reunited for gigs here and there. But with Bobby gone and Tommy DeBard battling his own drug and alcohol addictions, there was small hope for a reunion until one day in 2003, when Greg heard a tape of an upcoming artist, Achille Nixon. Achille sounded so much like Bobby. So Greg called him and said, hey, how do you feel about working with Switch? After that, they started doing quite a bit of shows, and they've been back together since 2003. The group members continue to tour today with the idea of putting out an album at some point in the future. 